see if I can integrate these things together. In the 60s and 70s, we learned how to go and land on the moon and stay and do some things there. To do that again 50 years later just does not seem to be something that would be attractive to the in people involved or the people who were supporting this. We did not build permanent there. Other countries will build landers. While they are doing that, we can build the permanent structures. But those permanent structures will be the same ones in the same base design that we will do at the moon. In order to build those on the moon, we need uh, a, a fairly redundant facility on the near side and on the far side to robotically build those. We can design them with our concepts of a base, and we know that Europe has a company that built pressure vessels for the uh, space station, and they can get additional resources in South Korea and India, so they can build the modules that will uh, go to the moon. Based on our design, they need to be standard. And we have uneven terrain in a gravity field, so you pick one off of a lander and put it where you want it. Now, another lander is over here. You pick this one up and bring it over. They won't line up. You've got to level them. You've got a difference in elevation. You've got to account for, account for that. Just too much for the students at Purdue. It will be done, but I'm going to another resource to help the, the students in Purdue to, uh, in their study to do that. But the habitats that will be based on what we want at Mars will then be exercised at the moon. Before we do that, we'll use the big island of Hawaii to make sure that the things all come together. We need an inflatable right away at Earth orbit, L1 and L2. We'll develop a rigid and we'll put it at those two places. Those rigids are what we construct things on. And they're the ones that, uh, uh, that will be similar to what we're going to build and send to Mars with a build-up so that at the time our cycling system deposits the first people on Mars, that build-up will be complete. So, so we have something that's integrated. Now, what can we do with that inflatable and an Orion? Well, we could send it to an asteroid. And we could send a robot, year-and-a-half mission, and the crew gets there in four months, two days before. But it's got 60 days at that asteroid with a scientist who knows about asteroids, a robotic scientist. That's a crew and a robot at the same asteroid in place. Now, that's with the inflatable. When we get to the rigid, we can send Orion with the rigid on a round flyby of Venus. We can do that in a year. It takes a whole lot longer to do it at Mars. When we come back, we can uh, exercise aero capture maneuvers that need to be done uh, at, at Mars. So we'll be doing these things and we'll be landing. Different people will be building and landing and we'll be getting this, these habitats. The, the different habitats, nine, we'll take three of them and we condition it for it's the cycler. And we get it in its cycle, and then we use three landers for triple redundancy. And we, because all a lander has to do is to get on the cycler. Cycler supplies it with everything it needs. It gets off and lands. And the facilities are, are there for them to take care of. And each pass that that outbound, we reuse the same facility. So we don't have to build them again and we can have an inbound cycler that can bring people back in emergencies. It's a plan that is built and integrated, evolving as we go along. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Senator Nelson. Mr. Chairman, I want to defer to Senator Udall, and uh, I would just say, with our goal of going to Mars, going to an asteroid, going back to the moon, if we're going to the moon, then show me the money. That's the question as we're going forward on the budgets that we are projecting. And I'll get into that a little later when I get to my questions. 
Thank, thank you, uh, Chairman Cruz, for calling this important hearing, and uh, Ranking Senator Bill Nelson, thank you for your courtesies and allowing me to to uh, uh, go forward at first in questioning on this side. And thank you to the witnesses. You, you've given some very impressive testimony. Thank you for your service today. Scientific research and improving technology transfer and commercialization is smart investment. There's just no doubt about it. And it's vital to our nation's future and for national defense and for our economy. In my home state of New Mexico, we know this firsthand. Uh, NASA workers in New Mexico support crucial missions, including communication with the International Space Station. Astronomers at our research telescopes are making new discoveries about black holes and planets outside our solar system. One of those uh, uh, astronomy operations is called the Very Large Array, which is in New Mexico and does a lot of that uh, work. Uh, researchers at our national labs and universities are working hard to keep America safe and to create jobs through innovative technologies like advanced photonics. So I look forward to working for, with uh, Chairman Cruz and, and uh, the ranking Senator Nelson on legislation before this committee, including America Competes Act, the Commercial Space Launch Act, and NASA's reauthorization. And I also want to uh, thank Senator Nelson uh, as our previous chairman, under his leadership, the Senate passed the Bipartisan NASA Authorization Act of 2010. Very few senators have been astronauts like Senator Nelson. He may be the most passionate advocate for space exploration who's ever served in the Congress, and I'm honored to serve with him on this committee. Now, Dr. Um, Massimino, and I put the rest of my opening statement in the record, but um, Congress passed the last NASA Authorization Act in 2010, as I just mentioned. This law continues to guide NASA as a multi-mission agency. Uh, and, and to quote that multi-mission from the statute, quote, balanced and robust set of core commissions in science, aeronautics, and human space flight and exploration. Could you share your thoughts on the advantages of keeping NASA as a multi-mission agency, which encompasses not just human spaceflight, but also initiatives such as space-based observations of the Earth. Um, I, you know, when I was, my, my time as an astronaut, there was a lot of things going on in our country. You know, we had uh, military uh, situations, we had uh, economic effects, a lot of things happened. And I kind of got the sense that as a government agency, um, if we had resources that could help, whatever that meant to whatever our country was, whatever our country needed, that it was important for us to try to contribute what we could. So you make the example of, of you, you mentioned Earth observations, for example. Well, on the International Space Station, it was a great engineering project, international. It's amazing that, that this thing is up there, this great laboratory, and we can do a lot of basic research up there. But in addition to that, we're able to have this perch above our planet where we can take amazing photos. In fact, my students in my class, we're doing a, our, our project for the semester, is an astronaut assistant to help them take these photos. And the reason is it's not just fun photos. They can show us natural disasters that occur. You can get a lot of information from them. Uh, changes in, in the planet, whether it be uh, irrigation problems or volcanoes erupting or whatever it might be. There's a lot of science data that can come and help our country, help our planet, by the astronauts taking photos from the International Space Station. It might be somewhat of a kind of a, a simple example, but I don't necessarily think it is. It, we're using our resources to help other agencies and improve life and increase our understanding. So I think in, if, if there's a way that NASA can contribute to that, and I'm not a NASA guy anymore, but I always felt when I was as an astronaut, if there's anything I could do to contribute that would help our country or help the world, that we owed it owed us to do that. It may not be our primary focus, but guess what? We maybe can make a contribution in those areas as well. Just a quick question, because mm -hmm. I only have a few seconds left, but I, it seems to me there's a great potential to develop the STEM fields in terms of Absolutely. what we're talking about here. Could you just... Yeah. Talk a little bit about that in terms of... Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, th I think what I, what I found, um, again, a lot of this comes from my, my more recent experience as, uh, as a university professor, that uh, the, the kids need something to be excited about. Studying math and science, I'm not as smart as Buzz was at MIT. Buzz was a really smart guy. I struggled up there. It was tough. 
okay? And I needed inspiration to hang out and, and hang in there and get through. And I think that a lot of students today need that as well. It's not easy studying this stuff. And if you have a goal at the end that, hey, if I can finish this up, maybe I can make a contribution to whatever, whatever technology they're interested in, that's the kind of motivation they need. I have not found any feel. I would, I would, I would throw the challenge out there. Do you find anything else that, can, that could inspire kids, young people, to study those fields than, other than the space program? I haven't found it. It encompasses so many different areas. It excites them. It's something they think is really cool. It's the future. Um, it's making a contribution back to the planet. Uh, I, I, they, they just love it. And now when you add this, this opportunity to be entrepreneurs, I think we're really on to something. So I, I can't think of anything that would excite them more. And I see this in, in New York City, which you know, doesn't have its own NASA center up there. There's not so much of a presence as we have in other parts of the country. There still is great interest up there. Thank you, Thank you very much. And I've seen that with astronauts that travel to New Mexico, the excitement there, you go. there with the young people yep. in terms of all of the, the STEM fields. So yeah. um, sorry to excuse myself. The Senator Kerry's in foreign relations. I hope to get back and ask some additional questions. But thank you both, Senator Nelson and Senator Cruz. Thank you very much. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing today. And I'll be following uh, my colleague from New Mexico on the way up to the Foreign Relations Committee after after the uh, the question and dialogue we have here. You know, there, I don't think there's anything, as you said, Mr. Massimino, that captures the the human imagination uh, like exploration. Uh, and 28 years ago, I think it was probably around 1983. I wrote a letter. I would have been nine years old. I wrote a letter to NASA. Uh, here's the copy of the letter. I took a picture of it because it's not on email. It's a hard copy typed out letter. And this is the first, this is the response back from NASA. This is the first paragraph that they wrote back to me in my letter to them. Thank you for your recent letter and your interest in wanting to become an astronaut. We are especially happy to have the young people of the world show an interest in our space program. We have received hundreds of letters similar to yours. Now, I doubt if they're receiving letters today, they're receiving emails today, and I doubt if they're only receiving 100, they're probably receiving thousands. But this letter talks about the need to go into mathematics, the need to go into engineering or medicine. It talks about uh, the importance of our space program. They, not, they also spent, uh, sent a little a photograph of the, the, the crew. I think it was the, this is Sally Ride. It was STS-7, I believe, the first woman in space from the United States on the space shuttle program. Uh, and uh, obviously, first woman in space from the United States. The, but that was 28 years ago, actually more than that now, but it was 2011, mm -hmm. 28 years since I wrote this letter to NASA, mm -hmm. 2011, 1983. And I stood with my colleagues in the House of Representatives as we watched the closing of the chapter of the space shuttle program. So I was nine years old writing a letter about how I wanted to become an astronaut. Obviously, I failed miserably at it. Uh, <laughs> But 28 years later, standing in the cloakroom of the United States House of Representatives with my colleagues from around the country, watching this program come to an end, the program that had made me so interested in wanting to achieve more. I mean, Horace Greeley said, go west, young man. And we followed that phrase in American history, and we explored, and we, we fought, and we pioneered, and that's who we are. And so I'm so concerned about the, the testimony today, the, the comments that you made, that that we aren't capturing that imagination like we once were, that we're not driving new innovations. We are driving new innovations like we were, but how do we really instill that, that notion of exploration and really make it a reality? And it goes to the heart, I think, of what you've talked about today in the Orion program, and I want to kind of get to that. Um, we, we did the test launch. Uh, we did the test launch of the uh, Orion December 5th, 2014. Uh, we did it atop a ULA Delta IV heavy rocket. We tested this. And now it doesn't look like we're planning to carry astronauts until 2021. Can this country afford to wait to 2021? Can we wait that long? What can we do to push this up? How do we, again, capture that imagination that drives so many of us uh, to, 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 uh, to imagine, to aspire to space? So I guess I'd start to, what is it that we need to do to really drive this mission, this idea, this value? <clears throat> of space. It's not just reports and paperwork. It's something that we've got to do ourselves. I think it would help to refocus NASA back on what they did that did provide that inspiration. Uh, just to give you another thought, I was listening here about the STEM education. <clears throat> I am a strong believer in that. That's what my education was. It's what uh, probably everybody here's education was at this table. 
We work with the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. We give, uh, now we're up to 30 or 32 uh, awards every year for this kind of education. But if we look at the organization NASA, NASA is also giving out many scholarships now. Now, NASA is a space agency. I think that if they're going to be giving scholarships and they, if the funds can maybe be diverted to some place where they focus on that, NASA needs to be spending their time and their focus on those things that inspire people to do these. Uh, exploration is, is, is what I happen to believe the long term. Look at it. But they need to be spending their money on those things that inspire others to, get, to make their uh, scholarships derived from other places. I work with scholarships all the time. I, I believe in them. But I think that the agency, is just you know, one more thing that they probably have, let's just guess, maybe a couple of dozen people that are working just focusing on that as opposed to doing what they did before and letting the inspiration drive those things. It's just uh, another alternative I'm, I'm, I'm raising about it. Dr. Aldrin, please. I'd like to tell a, a little story about uh, the, month, the months before I left NASA in 1970. Uh, I was asked to go down to another center where the next program to follow Apollo was being looked at. And there were hundreds of aerospace engineers and let me describe what the next system was. And this is 1970. We may have uh, flown uh, Apollo 12 and maybe 13. It was two-stage, fully reusable. An orbiter with wings and wheels and a booster with wings and wheels. And it carried the crew. It didn't carry cargo. You want cargo, you use a reusable booster and you put the cargo on top of that. So I went down there to look at the assembly of people. They had seven teams, a, a contractor for a booster and the orbiter, seven of those. And some of them doubled up, of course, here and there, and they built models. So my job was to look at the, uh, at the upper stage, the, uh, uh, the orbiter, okay, and to see what the people could see during launch orbit and come down and land. And I happened to glance down, and I saw windows in the booster, Okay, I can explain that now for high-speed taxi and such. But I asked the guy, what are these windows here? Oh, when we go up as a booster on a normal mission, we've got a cockpit with, a, with two people in a booster. And I said, you what? We have seven teams. And before they started their study, we asked them to do a real short study, manned versus unmanned booster. Now, if you're one of these seven teams and you know what the client wants, and if you give him what he wants, you're going to make more money. Obviously, all those reports said, yes, you're right. We're going to put a cockpit of two in the booster. Totally unnecessary. By the time that started getting implemented, George Gilruth said to another person, I wonder if we should have put a cockpit in the booster. Okay. It was canceled. We had to rush into the shuttle. We would love to have a program like that now, but it was because jealousies of individual centers and wanting to do things and the uh, companies wanting to take a bid that would get the more money and maybe bring it back to where their, uh, where their states were doing things. That was inexcusable to me. And there are other examples uh, like that. We, we've got <clears throat> three different spacecraft uh, to come back, commercial spacecraft, and one advanced one that's been looked at by the Russians, looked at by the Air Force, and wind tunnel tests, and it brings things back. What do we finance? The two capsules with not really new technology, and we don't finance the one that can land on a runway. I think we're making not so good choices many times. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Senator Nelson. First of all, I want to welcome uh, our guest, uh, dear personal friends, and thank you for what you've done for this country. Uh, each of you in your own contribution 
as we have built uh, this amazing thing that we're discussing today, our American space program. The goal is to go to Mars. The goal is to get NASA beyond low Earth orbit. And the question is, over the course of these years, as we target the decade of the 2030s, with the budget that we're going to have, how do we do it? How do we develop the technologies, the techniques, the systems, the life support systems, the propulsion systems uh, that will get us to a foreign body such as Mars with a crew and return them safely? So um, we may want to go back to the moon as we develop this, but as I said early, earlier, show me the money. Uh, Dr. Massimino, I want to ask you to comment on the plans uh, to capture an asteroid, bring it back into a stable lunar orbit, and send a crew up there to land on it. That as part of the steps as we prepare all of those things I just mentioned, eventually to go to Mars in the decade of the 2030s. Um, thank you, sir. I, I, I think we need to remember one, one thing overall, that going to space is hard. And I think we need to remember that there's only been one country that has put people out of Earth orbit, and that's us. And we did it a long time ago when we sent Buzz and his colleagues up there. But still, the United States of America is the only country that's been able to figure that out. It's not so easy going to space. Um, it's not so easy. It's, it's even harder to go beyond low Earth orbit to places like the moon or to Mars. And if we, take an if we decide we're going to take an incremental approach, which would be the, the asteroid mission, um, I think there's definitely a lot that can be learned there. Uh, we can f test this big rocket that can take us places beyond low Earth orbit. We can test a spacecraft that would do it. We can test life support. Space is a very hazardous place. There's a lot of radiation, when you, and it gets worse as you get further away from the planet. The radiation dose we took on Hubble was higher than what the guys get, the men and women get on space station, because we were 100 miles higher. Going to the moon's even worse. Going beyond that's even worse. We need to understand how we can protect our people from that, right? And we're, we're taking those steps with the research we do on the space station. How are we going to keep them healthy? All the changes that happens to the body. How are we going to keep people healthy enough to be able to withstand the journey to Mars, be able to land a spacecraft, and be able to work and then come home? This is, this is tough stuff. We, not, we may or may not be able to do that all in one big swing. It may be too much to do it in one swing. But I think we need to start taking those first steps. First step is get the big launch vehicle going like we have with a successful test flight and the other ones that are planned. They are far in the future, but these are tough things to do. And I don't know if more budget would make it quicker. I don't know. Maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. Maybe it would give you better, better, uh, a better chance of getting there, but I don't know if it necessarily makes you more efficient. But these are hard things to do. But going to the, going, if the asteroid mission is the right thing to do, I think there's a, certainly a lot we can, we can learn from it. I think we can work out the spacecraft, keeping the people healthy, uh, understanding how to work that launch system. And it's also, a, it is a destination. You're not going to land and have to blast off again from it like you went on the moon or Mars, but it is, it is a place you can go to, and we certainly can learn a lot from it. Is it necessary? I don't know. It might be because we might need that incremental step before we can take the big leap. Um, but I think right now the important thing is to try to be consistent with it and to pull the rug out from where we are. I think there might be a penalty there as well. There was a, a couple programs as, in my career as an astronaut. We worked on different spacecraft. We worked on all, I, started, I had a dinner with, uh, with two of my friends last night who are now former astronauts out here in Washington. We talked about all the stuff that was canceled while we were astronauts, all the stuff we trained on while we were astronauts. And to make a big, huge direction change sometimes isn't always the best thing. Well, you were there in the astronaut office when the Constellation program was canceled. Mm -hmm. It was way behind, and it was over, uh, way over budget. So that's what you're talking about. 
Uh, actually, what you, uh, yeah. what you sacrifice mm -hmm. if yeah. you make a major change in the human spaceflight program. Yeah, and it's, it's a lot of, I wasn't, if, that was a big one, but there are other ones too, like our, our cockpit avionics upgrade on the space shuttle. Um, that was, they started doing the wiring on that in one of the space shuttles. It had gone along, we had spent a lot of time designing that upgrade, for example. And then that got cut, and the story we had was that it was going to cost almost as much to pull it out than it was to finish the job. There were other uh, options for spacecraft, res rescue spacecraft from the space station that we were developing. They did, they did tests out in the desert, dropped them out of airplanes, landing tests, a lot of cockpit design work was done. Again, these, these projects were, were cut. So I think there is a penalty to pulling the, everything back. And uh, the, you know, whether we go, again, if we go to the asteroid or we go to the moon or Mars, you know, I think it's important to keep, keep the momentum going of getting the spaceship ready, getting the rocket ready, um, keeping your options open until you're really sure which one you want to go to, because you might find that you might not pick the first, the right one right off the bat. Maybe we can go to Mars in one swoop, but maybe we can't, and, and the asteroid mission is a great way to test our systems out and get the knowledge we do, because we want to be successful when we go to Mars. That's a huge leap. That's a really long journey. And that's, that's not even, you know, compared to the moon, it's a long way. This man went a long distance from our planet. That's a heck of a lot further. We're going to make sure we get it right when we do that. And if that asteroid mission or something we do with the moon is going to help us get there, that's great. Can I add a thought to the questionnaire having to do with budget? It's always going to be expensive for what they're talking about trying to do. I mentioned that for 40 years, the NASA budget's been less than 1% of the federal budget. For the last 15 years, it's been driving down to 0.4% of the federal budget. Unless the country, which really is Congress here, decides to put more money in it, this is just talk that we're going through here. The budget has got to go up for NASA, and that's another reason why I feel very strongly that NASA has to be operating more efficiently and not doing some of the things which would be marginal as opposed to it. You've got to focus it on what has to be done. NASA's budget is way too low to do the things that we talked about doing here this afternoon. Absolutely, and, and I'd like to point out that I've got this study being done at Purdue near the end of April. I've assembled 25 other academic institutions that deal with exploration. Academic institutions are supposed to be unbiased. They're supposed to teach the general background. So if we can come up with a number of questions, some of them are yes, no, uh, maybe. Uh, some of them are tell me shortly. How do we get the public behind what it is we're trying to do? Well, I, they're going to know what, what I'm trying to do briefly because I'm going to show them and I'm going to give them my assumptions that I've had to make. <clears throat> what is the strategy to get the public behind us? And what kind of strategy do we need to fund something uh, in uh, 2040? Do we step increase to make up for things? And then do we have a ramp up? Not just cost of living, but a ramp up because expenditures are going to be greater. They did during the, the Apollo program. Now, another question. Do we have a relationship with China? It's very significant if we're going to deal with leadership. I don't want to get into a lot of that, but I think if we don't, if we really do, or in between, we shouldn't do things differently at the moon. We still should build things there so we can build somewhere else, but we don't have to land there. China needs the things we can build. We have to exert leadership by working with them in low Earth orbit. Next July is the 40th anniversary of Apollo Soyuz. 75 was pretty contentious in the Cold War, much worse than our relations with China today. Why, can't, why did we refuse them to come to our space station? It doesn't make any sense to me. We should be doing that sort of thing together, building on, uh, sharing what it is we're doing. They've got a lot of things to do with the moon. We can help them in their permanence because it helps us with our permanence uh, at Mars. They're, they're just Now, if I ask them about asteroid, uh, you can fly it the way it is. You can cancel it, or you can do something smart in between. 
Now, if you understand what that smart is in between, by sending a robot there to an asteroid, then send a crew to it, and on board the crew, you got an asteroid scientist, a robotic, and they can stay there 60 days. The combined mission is better than a robot or better than a crew mission. Don't these people talk to themselves in Washington? Why do I have to come up and say, if you combine the mission, it's a whole lot better, and you can do it where an asteroid is, like the National Research Council said we should do. But maybe that's not essential. I happen to think it is, where you can fly Orion with a long-duration support system. That's what we're going to do when we go to L1 or L2. We're going to take an Orion up there, and there's going to be a system that lets us stay for much longer. We're going to be rotating commercial crews up and down, not just to the space station, but commercials are going to go to the vicinity of the moon. We're going to do these things, and we're going to build, but we don't have to put all the money in building those habitats because the foreigners are going to want them, and we're going to want them there, and we're going to want them at Mars. The foreigners have to land Okay, we're going to develop a very sophisticated landing system, and we're going to be landing so many people at Mars that we can take them along on the first landing. Okay, take us along as visitors on your landings. Let, let's not go broke by doing things back at the moon, but let's astutely learn to do things there that do make sense. And I think if you ask uh, industry, or if you ask government, you're going to get a biased answer. But if you ask academia, I, I'm looking forward to this poll on, on significant questions coming back from 25 different academic institutions. Well, th thank you very much.